welcome to 330 to go. Don't change that dial. We're going to be live in just under three minutes. We've got a really fun show in store for you tonight. Folks, if you haven't done so, please make sure you enable 330 to go's morning minute on your Alexa app flash morning briefings. We provide daily content to give you information on what's going on here and there in the 330 as well as giving you regular daily specials for where to shop and where to get discounts at local restaurants. If you haven't done so, make sure you check out our website, 330to.go.com. You'll find all of our podcasts archived and all of our webcasts available on both YouTube and on Facebook. Please make sure you go to our page, 330to.go, hit that like button, and make sure you follow us. We do offer regular specials and regular giveaways. We really love giving stuff away. If you haven't done so, please head over to our review page as well and let us know that you watch a show. Tell us what we do right and different areas where we might be able to improve. If you have an idea or a topic that you'd like us to cover, Please make sure you get a hold of us and we'll be happy to try and work it into our schedule. If you'd ever like to be in our viewing audience, we do have seating available for just about every show we do. So once again, please make sure you get a hold of us and we'd be happy for you to be our guest. Folks, we're almost there. It's almost time. Make sure that you're adjusted with your volume. Grab a drink and away we go. Take care, folks, and enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Akron's hottest and fastest growing show, 330 to go. I'm your host, Hank Forrester, coming to you live from somewhere inside Summit County. In tonight's episode, we're going to discuss all things that are hunting related in and around the 330. But before we do that, we're once again joined by the dulcet tones of Danny Marie. Uh, I guess Danny's not here right now. Hi, Doug. Hey, Hank. How are you? Uh, well, hold on. I got to cue that up, right? That's the one thing that uh, always seems to malfunction on us. It's this one right here. I'm just living the dream, Doug. I'm just, I'm just living, I'm just the, living, living the, the dream. dream. <laughs> just living the dream. <laughs> All right, folks, let's pay the bills. Tonight's episode is brought to us by Acme Fresh Markets. That's right. As we mentioned previously, we're going to be proud to start partnering with Acme as we're going to start broadcasting our live shows in October from right inside Acme number one. Uh, just a reminder, folks, that Acme, turn volume down and sounds up on mic. Okay. Uh, the, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, <laughs> I'm getting, already getting uh, uh, some. Turn volume down and sounds up on mic. All right. Let's try that. And that. How are we doing there, uh, Kate? Can you hear us, Kate? Can you hear us, Kate, out there? Volume, mic's up. Check on mic. And volume down. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, just a reminder that Acme has extended our promotional code as well. Uh, enter 330 to go as a promo code at orderacme.com, and you're going to get $3.30 off any order that's greater than $50. 
Groceries are literally at the tip of your fingers and will be delivered to your doorstep. So make sure you take advantage of that. In addition, if you haven't done so, uh, make sure that you enable our Alexa Morning Minute. Uh, every morning, I wake you guys up with one minute of weather, fun news, things to do, and special savings in and around the 330. Go to 330togo.com uh, forward slash Alexa for a tutorial. And please don't pay attention to the weather that I gave out this morning because I gave you the weather for Washington, D.C. No, it is not 85 degrees right now in the 330. Um, please, folks, go ahead and share this right now. Share it to your timeline. Uh, smash the like button. Send up some hearts for us right now. And make sure that you review the show afterward because we're always looking for feedback as we expand our platform and as we continue to grow. As I mentioned, we've recently added two additional shows uh, to the mix. Uh, in addition to the Hop and Bean, uh, which will be live tomorrow from Ignite Brewing Company over in Barberton, uh, we also have Does It Suck, which is our review show now, and also uh, 27 Squared, which is a nice little neat vlog of things around town. Uh, but folks, tonight we're lucky enough to have been invited to join the team from Created Outdoors. So I wanted to thank Doug for allowing us to be here, and I get to sit in front of this really pretty, beautiful truck, even though it's not a Ford. We are here to discuss hunting, among other things. So right now, away we go. All right, first off, hi, Doug. Hey, man. How are you? I'm good. So thanks for letting me hang out. Yeah, So. Anytime. Go ahead. Let's start. Let's let's go back to the beginning, right? So you've got this platform. It's it's created outdoors. Okay. Yeah. Um, why don't you tell us what that is? Yeah. So created outdoors. We're we're an outdoors program. We uh, are broadcast on national television with the uh, Pursuit Channel. Uh, we've we've been uh, with Pursuit Channel for two years. Um, we're blessed to have a, a really good following and a really good group of guys on our team. Um, and we have some amazing sponsors that are are invested. And what we're all about. So we are we're very happy about it. Okay. Um, how long have you guys been doing this? I've been in the outdoor industry for 16 years. Created Outdoors is now filming currently starting this Saturday uh, for season number three. Okay. And explain to us what 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 entails the season. What do you guys do? What do you cover? Yeah. So we we I mean we cover turkey season, spring. Um, we do some elk hunting, some moose hunting. Uh, those are things that we have planned coming up, um, but mostly whitetail and turkey, things that are relative to the 330. Okay. All right, so let's talk about that. Let's, let's get in. And, and the reason I reached out to you guys, right, so I'll tell you my brief story. So I've been around hunting most of my life. My uncle is an avid hunter. My grandpa used to go hunting with him, uh, and, and my father-in-law uh, is, a, is a hunter as well. Uh, not so much in his age that he's at now. He's in his 80s. Right. And now he likes to just have, he likes to feed the deer. He likes them to come to the back porch. Right. Okay, so yeah. he's kind of changed that thought process. But but from a hunting standpoint, I've never been hunting. I'm 44. I've shot a lot of guns in my life, okay? But it's not like something that's been a part of my life, okay? So explain to us, uh, first and foremost, how did you get into hunting, and how has it become a passion? Absolutely. So I grew up in Kenmore uh, in the 330, I mean, in the middle of the heart of the 330. So um, our family Bazinga. vacations were, I, I tell everybody, were redneck family vacations. Right. Because uh, we went to West Virginia, uh, we'd go to uh, Pennsylvania, and we did go to Texas in 1987. So... Um, those were the kind of things my, my, my dad would take us hunting. Okay. Um, that was what we did. When, when time was taken off in our family, uh, you know, my, my dad went hunting with his dad, and I went hunting with my dad. So that was kind of our thing. And it's interesting because I mentioned to you before the show that that's one thing that was missing on my end. Correct. My, yeah. my, dad, my dad was in the military. He's a, a, he's a Marine Corps veteran. Um, but he just, just he wasn't into hunting. He just yeah. wasn't. Right. So from that standpoint, you know, you and I talked about that in terms of uh, is is hunting something that's more generational that gets kind of passed down. Right. And and to that end, we have a special guest joining us right now. Oh, he's coming. He's 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 coming in right now. Here he is, folks. Let's hear it for Deegan, everybody. Let's hear it for Deegan, everybody out there. Okay. So, to that end, it, you know, as it's generational, 
it gets passed down, right? So what? who is this kid? Who's this guy right here? And tell us his story, and if he'd like to share his story as well, and how have you incorporated hunting into your family? Yeah, so uh, this is Deegan. He's my 8-year-old son, and the one and only Deegan. And uh, tell, tell everybody what you think about hunting. Mm, it's fun. You're going to have to speak up at the mic, all right, Deegan? It's fun. Okay. Why is it, why is it fun? Because you get to shoot deer. And you get to spend time out in, in, in the beautiful outdoors and spend time with your dad and make memories, right? Right. It's not always about the, the, the harvesting of an animal. It's about a lot about the memories that we get to share together and be away from the city and the, and the lights and all that stuff and just be out in God's country, right? Right. And it's interesting you used a word there, and that's harvest. Um, I watched your sh- in preparation for being with you here tonight. I did watch your, a couple episodes of your show, and and I I noticed that was the word that's used repeatedly. <coughs> in other words, <coughs> not killing animals, you're harvesting animals, right? Because <coughs> to my understanding, all of you guys, along with everybody that I know that hunts, they literally use every single part of the animal. Mm-hmm. It's then it, it, you you eat it. Uh, you use all, uh, you use everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's an important thing that I want to uh, drill down as a as a theme as we go through this discussion this evening. Yeah. Okay? Absolutely. Um, because you know, <coughs> people people <coughs> excuse me. Oh, oh, oh. All right. people had actually uh, criticized the fact that I was even going to do this show, and my retort to them was, "Do you eat meat?" Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of us have this tendency to go to our favorite burger joint and go to our favorite restaurants and we eat, uh, fish and we eat turkey and we eat brisket and we eat ribs and we eat anything that's meat related. Right. And, and we're consuming it as a country and as an American public, but we're not thinking about the other end of that, which is, okay, at some point there was an animal here and the animal had to, had to pass away to give us this food. Right. Um, where you guys are doing it yourself. Okay. And that to me is something that is one of the points I want to drive home with tonight. Okay. Well, first of all, let's get, let's get into the seasons. Okay. Now, Again, folks, it's me. I'm Hank. Okay, I've never, I've literally never hunted in my life. That's not entirely accurate. I've hunted groundhog, but it wasn't like hunting. It was a, uh, a nuisance disposal type situation, right? Because <laughs> right. groundhog completely destroy farms. Okay, so my all my brother in laws they handed me a gun. They they said, "You stand here, and if you see something, just shoot it." I'm like, "Okay," <laughs> knowing full well that I wasn't going to be in on the action. They were all where everything was going yeah. on, right? So I was basically on a snipe hunt by myself. <laughs> all right. So the point is, um, a, cool you, story, bro. I know that there's seasons, and the seasons are all broken down into all kinds of different rules and regulations. Okay, so let's focus right here. Let's just talk like some. Summit County, Medina County, Youngstown area, Canton area. What are the seasons that someone can hunt? Yeah, so, I mean, right now you have waterfowl season. So you, you, you have uh, goose seasons in. You have uh, deer season that's starting this Saturday. Um, and, and then oh, squirrel season's in right now. So there are various types of seasons, types of game uh, that you can pursue right now. And, and, and also, you know, fishing. Fishing is a year-round thing that um, is, is something that's overlooked, too. Let's talk quickly about the licensing of all of that. Okay, so I know when I if I fish, uh, turn his mic up, honey. I think it's just a thing that he's just there. We we'll still move closer. Away. There we go. All right, <clears throat> Lo- love you, Kate. Thank you. Um, I think it's a it, it, you know for example, I know that to fish I have to go get a license. Okay, what does it take? What are the what's the process to get a hunting license? So if you've had a hunting license in Ohio prior. Um, Then you go spend your $24 and you buy your $20 tag. Uh, The tag covers a a, a a deer tag or a turkey tag. So for each animal you harvest, you have to buy a doe or buck tag. They call it an either sex tag. Okay. So you can can shoot one buck per per calendar year in the state of Ohio. Okay. Um, Or you can shoot up to however many your county will allow you for does in the county. Okay. So it's different per county? Yes. Okay. And that was something new that they did last year. And again, just so just so we know, folks, the the premise of the show tonight is for beginners, 
for folks that are interested in hunting and mostly haven't had a chance to do so. This is not for your expert hunter. You guys can feel free to make sure you contribute with your comments. We'd appreciate your comments. But the the information we're going over tonight is more for a novice. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, so, all right. So there's is uh, are there times where the number fluctuates year to year? Is that how it works? Number of number of does or whatever, or what no, you're allowed to harvest. It's a, it's a consistent thing. Like Summit County, I believe you're allowed to shoot a buck and two does per county. Okay. Um, but that one buck is your buck for the year per state. Okay. So, um, you do have to buy, like I said, a tag for each one of those. Okay. Animals. And I've heard I've heard that term used a thousand times by my hunting friends about tagged. You know, they yeah. they tagged an animal. So, um. So what? Uh, okay, so you said you you mentioned waterfowl, deer, squirrels. Okay, is there is it broken down by weaponry as well? Yeah. So you have uh, right now this this coming Saturday uh, kicks off whitetail archery season in the state of Ohio, and then uh, usually the first Monday after Thanksgiving is when deer gun season comes in. So then we have a seven day long season for deer gun season. So that's when a, a majority of the, the, the hunters, the guys that want to take a week off work or the, the new hunters that aren't into the bow hunting yet uh, want to take time off because they're, the chances increase with deer movement because there's a lot of people in the woods, you know? Okay. And, and they use firearms such as a gun, a shotgun, or a straight-walled rifle cartridge. Is there a difference in the seasons between crossbow versus compound bow? No, compound and crossbow in the state of Ohio are both to be used at the exact same time. So you can, so to speak, use your weapon of choice. Okay. E- either one. So it's bow hunting season. Yeah, and, and you just... can actually bow hunt during gun season, Okay, but you have to abide by the gun law. So you would have to wear uh, the proper orange hunting vest and orange hunting hat to be able to bow hunt during gun season. Okay, so let's let's talk about that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into... We'll get into that. Uh, I've got that down here uh, lower. Um, uh, Jerry's pointing out to us. Thank you, Jerry, for being a part of the show tonight, and Derek, too. Um, w- so before anything else happens, okay, so step one, I want to become a hunter. What is the very first thing that someone should do? The very first thing you should do is go on to the Department of Natural Resources website, and you're going to want to study. They actually have a study guide and you have to get certified with the Hunter Safety Course in Ohio so you can take the test, pass the test, and be a licensed hunter in the state of Ohio. Now, there are apprentice uh, programs, so you can be an apprentice um, to go out with a licensed hunter that's not carrying a firearm, so they could basically take you under their wing and teach you the proper ways to do it and some of the laws and stuff. Um, So that's a really good way uh, to get a new hunter out in the woods, too. All right, so give me an idea. What is a typical – the course is different. Like, like, you know how you go to driver's ed, right? You can go to – it's it's driver's ed. It's all the same course from the state of Ohio, but you could get it at 50 different places. Is, right. that, is that how hunting is too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, now – I mean, back in the day, you'd had to find a place that was – sit down to take the test. Now you can actually do the whole thing online. Okay. Um, so, so that's nice, but it's a very uniform test. So it's – I mean – if you went down the street and took it, it'd be the same test that you took up the street. It's the, it's the exact same thing. Okay, uh, give us an idea. What's a generic cost structure for that? I, I think it's completely free through the state. There's no cost with it. Okay, there's no cost with it. So you you can take a hunter safety course online for free, is what you're yep. telling me. Yep. And then you pass it, and they'll say, okay, you can now go hunt. Yeah, they they basically certify you. Quit putting your head on that. <clears throat> they actually they certify you, so uh, they give you based off your social security number. And, and, and one thing that people need to realize, too, if you ever go out of state to hunt another state, you have to be certified in your state to hunt out of state. Okay. So it's per state then because there's different rules and regulations? So, so they'll say, are you hunter's education certified in your home state? Okay. And you say yes, and then that's what they use to give you your license in another state. Okay. All right, so you get your license. You're good to go. And now, instead of uh, taking your paintball gun out, you're gonna you're gonna get a weapon, right? Okay, big boy, big boy weapon. Time for a big boy weapon. So, 
how do what what does that process look like? How how does somebody that's never owned a gun before? And again, a lot of this is passed down from from father to son. Right. Okay, but let's talk about your average college kid that wants to go hunting and their dad like for example like my dad wasn't into it and i just you know my buddies all hunt and i want to learn how to hunt right yeah so now it's time to buy my first weapon yep w- how walk me through that process yeah so i guess the, the the first factor would be what do you want to hunt with do you want to hunt with a bow do you want to hunt with a crossbow do you want to hunt with a firearm uh and and making that choice and then once you've made that choice, obviously you want to be proficient with what you're using. Sure. Right? So um, if it's archery, find a good archery shop that can give you instruction, show you the proper uh, instruments to buy for your bow, the, the, a good bow, a good sight, a good arrow, you know, all the things you need, the tools of the trade. Okay. Hugely important. Well, and, and we'll get into that too in terms of cost and expense too, because you can really go into the weeds. <laughs> hey, uh, so Brittany, uh, thanks for tuning in, Brittany. She's busting your chops right now. She's saying, "What? Mellow yellow, no blueberry coffee." All right. So, but I think he's got both, Brittany. It looks I'm like he's got dipping. both. All right. So, um, all right. So we're start we're starting our search for a weapon. Okay. Um, so let's say, figuratively speaking, that they want to use a gun. So they want to. So. It, this is where this is where I get confused, right? Because again, my uncle does every season, so he. I've heard the term muzzle loader. Yep. I've heard the term shotgun. And I've heard the term rifle. Yep. Okay, so ex- explain that to me. So you know, in Ohio, you can hunt with a shotgun. Okay, obviously during gun season, you can use straight walled rifle rounds. Okay, um, which which is you know like a thirty thirty or a, a forty five seventy. Um, straight walled rifle rounds, or you can use a muzzleloader during Ohio gun season. Okay. Now there is a special muzzleloader season that you can use muzzleloader loader only later in the season. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting you know getting the right gun that you feel comfortable with shooting for. You know, if you're a a, a little a little guy like this, obviously you don't want to shoot a 12 gauge three and a half inch slug because it's gonna it's gonna hurt the shoulder. Sure. Um, so knowing the weapon that you use. Um, is is going to be comfortable for you to use that that you're proficient in in your target range, right? So, do you want to shoot uh you know deer at a hundred yards? Do you want to shoot them at twenty yards? So knowing all those factors and going to a gun shop or or a buddy that has experience in it where they can educate you and teach you what to do and what not to do. Um, you you have to have that seasoned person or that seasoned place to to instruct you or. YouTube, yeah. Well, and and again, I anytime I want to cook something, I go to YouTube to learn how to do it. Right. Yep. Um. So, uh, it, bazinga. It's one of those deals where I would think, and again, this is me being ignorant. I would think. Is he is he checking out? He gone. <laughs> All right, Deegan. Uh, let's hear it for Deegan, everybody. All right. Um, I would think that first step is I would go to some sort of a range or something. Yep. And I would say I'm new. I'm a beginner. Let's try out some guns. And I'm assuming that they do that sort of thing? Yeah, you can go like down here in Barber and the Marksman's got a range. They got guns. You can actually go rent the guns so you can shoot okay. and, and experience the different calibers of weapons. So At the range. At the range. Okay. And it's safe. You know what I mean? They're gonna Well, it's in it. a controlled environment. Yeah. Hopefully they'll teach you what to do. All right. So okay, so that that that's that. And then and then of course, um, same thing with bow and crossbow. Now explain to me the difference in terms of the physicality or the the, the overall experience between uses a bow between using a bow, bow and a crossbow. Okay, so I would say uh, growing up here in Ohio and having a lot of big crossbow manufacturers right here in our backyard out in Suffield, um, I grew up as a crossbow hunter, right? Okay. And the reason I grew up as a crossbow hunter because it was the easiest weapon for me to get into the woods. Right? Okay. So uh, basically you buy the crossbow, it's got a scope on it or open sights, you shoot it a couple times, you know your target area, your range, and you could go into the woods. Whereas a compound, um, you got to practice with form and make sure everything's right. And you got you got like five things that you have to put together to be proficient, whereas a crossbow... It's more like shooting a gun. It's more like shooting a gun. Because you've got sights and all that. And, right. Okay. Right. Okay. Is it harder to, uh, for lack of a better term, is it cocking? Well, say, how, say how this. You you're, you're go into the woods, right? You, you show up to your hunting spot in the morning. You show up to your hunting spot, you got the crossbow. You cock the crossbow. Okay. You put your arrow in it. You walked in the woods to hunt. Okay. Okay. 
with a compound bow, you, you climb up in the tree, right? right? You hang up your bow, you put your arrow on, you put your wrist strap on, right? You got everything, everything's good to go. Okay. Big buck comes walking in with okay. crossbow. Okay. You're already ready to shoot. You click the safety off and you ease on the trigger. Right. Okay. Okay. Big buck comes and you got your compound. You have to grab the bow down. You have to clip your release on. You got to make sure he's not looking at you and you got to draw your bow back. Sure. And you got to settle in on him and then ease off on him. It's a lot more difficult. So there's a lot more movement. A lot more movement. Okay. So, you know, the skill level with the crossbow is really good. So if you get good with the crossbow and you feel like, like you're really good at it and you want to challenge yourself, Try the compound or try the you know the traditional. That's something we haven't talked about. The traditional, the guys that are using old recurves, right? Is that like just the wood the bow? Stick, they call it the stick and the string. Yep. Okay. There's, there's a that's a that's a growing market. That's there's a, thing? a lot of guys doing that. Yeah, really? Not, not this guy, but there are a lot of guys that are doing that. I got a story about that. We had I had one. You know, how you buy one as a kid in your late teens, yeah. right? <laughs> you know the story that's coming, right? <laughs> this is this is uh, this is this is. Cool story, bro. This will be edited out of the podcast for safety reasons. But you got you buy the little cheapo one, right? Yeah. And it's got like the little nub arrows. <laughs> and then, of course, you're bonfiring and drinking, and, and the game is you shoot him up in the air, and the other guy runs and tries to catch him. But um, he's but, that guy. But, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> point being, that was that was college days, right? And there, there was no alcohol involved at all. <laughs> which which brings me to another topic. Okay. When it comes to hunting, there's this stigma. There's this association with swilling down bud and being out in the woods and then and then shooting your guns all over the place, right? Right. I'm assuming that there's a whole different thought process from a hunter's point of view, right? Yeah. And there's there's times to be social and to be hanging out after right. hours at night. Yeah. Around the fire. My green. And then during and then during hunting time, everyone's sober, I'm assuming, right? For, uh, for in the, my camp, yes. <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> in my camp, that's a big yes. All right, so you are really affiliate. You got you're affiliated with all kinds of different sponsors and whatnot. So I'm not going to get you in trouble with this next question. But um, for the for, again for the beginner, where do you recommend they start in terms of the shopping experience? Where they, where should they start? Look. All right, so let's say they got their they got their gun. All right, and yep. they they got they they're like, hey, let's do it right. And they buy a bow, a, they buy a crossbow, and a and a, and a shotgun. Mm-hmm. All right, sort of they're ready to do multiple seasons and go after whatever they want. Right, so now it's gear time. Where do you where do people start to look for gear? The natural thought process is for, for again for novice me. I'm thinking like Gander Mountain. I'm thinking like Dicks. I'm thinking all you know, fin, right. feather, and fur, yeah. and all those places. Uh, yeah. Bass Pro Shops. And all those places are really good places. Um, you know, one of the things that I tell people is go try on and 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 make sure things fit you like like you're going to be comfortable in. So I mean, that's a huge thing. And also, you know, buy things that are big enough so you can layer your clothes. Because when it gets cold here in Ohio, you it know, gets cold. Oh yeah, you know it's not eighty five today, Hank. I wish I was you at the. Na- <laughs> it's not. It is not eighty five. Okay. So, you know, go try on what you want. You know, and and there's a lot of stores. You yeah, you know, you you have Kames, you have Gander Mountain, you have there's there's good places. They have good stuff, so you can buy good clothes and not have to drop five six hundred bucks. Well, you even said okay, so let's go over the clothing styles and the types. So what do you need for the different seasons? What's required? Well, I mean, gun season, you have to have your hunter's orange. So I, is, that, is that full orange? No, you have to have an orange vest. Okay. You know, that's something that the state mandates. You have to have an orange vest. Um, I always wear an orange hat and an orange vest. That may, If I'm walking, my head's bobbing and somebody's not going to shoot me. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. But, um, yeah, so just other than that, you can go full camo. Okay. So... I guess uh, how does that work in term do the seasons overlap or do are there stop points? So that you know like when we talked about gun season <clears throat> when bow season doesn't go out but you you can hunt with a bow during gun season but you have to adhere to the rules of that week of gun season. Okay. So you could take your bow out but you have to adhere to the rules so you'd have to have that orange vest on. Right. So in other words the moment gun season starts a orange is required. Correct. But up until that point, you can be in ghillie suits. Yeah, but now, now rabbit season, squirrel seasons, all those other seasons, when gun season comes in, they're all gone. They're out. Explain. Explain. So you cannot squirrel hunt or rabbit hunt during Ohio deer shotgun week. Okay. Period. 
that uh, and and for those folks, they're allowed to wear full camo for the for the ra- squirrel and no, rabbit they, and they all are, that. that. That week, the season is out. No, I'm talking about earlier, before that. No, those those the folks that squirrel and rabbit hunt too are required to wear hunter's orange. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. So basically, if a gun is involved at all, it's orange. It's orange. Yep. Okay. And and if it's bows and muzzle all that, loader, mu- it's orange. Muzzle loader, it's orange. Okay. Yep. So anything with powder. Yep. All right. Got, got it. it. That makes sense. Okay. So all right. So from that standpoint, though. All right, so now we talked about the personal gear, right? So you can get, and there's so much you can get. You can get protective goggles, you can get gloves, you can get the, the full outfits and the whole deal, right? What, what, where do you begin in terms of the next level, which is now I want to set up some sort of a structure for me to hunt from, whether it be a stand or a tree stand. A, uh, I saw, I never heard of a blind before I watched your show. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. So what are all the things that are available out there? What can you use for what seasons? My gosh, there's, you know, for, for deer season, there's, you have a ton of different things that you can do. Um, you know, tree stands, if you're going to hunt by yourself, get a single, single man, hang on or a, a climbing tree stand. Those are different types. A hang on is a, basically a ladder that goes up the tree and you hang a tree stand off the side of the tree. Okay. Then you have, or you could have a climber, a climber. You walk in the woods, you find a straight tree with no branches and you put your bottom feet in it and your arms on the top and you just shimmy up the tree. Okay. Uh, so you have that or uh, a, a very popular thing now is ladder stands. Okay. So it's basically a, a, a ladder that's built in the stand, and you take the thing and you put it together, and you lean it against the tree, and you can walk up the ladder and get in the stand. And they make those um, or for um, two people. So, okay. like, if you wanted to take your son with you in the stand and have him sit next to you, that's a huge thing. But let's not forget this, Hank: safety in a tree stand. Got to have a harness. You don't have to have one. It's not a state law. But I will not get in a tree without a harness. How do those work? Are they f- like five point, or do they go around your whole body? Yeah, yeah, they're 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 a five point harness, so it goes around your legs, waist, and arms, and um, it's super typical easy. lanyards. Yeah, like yeah, f- it, safety lanyard. Yeah, it's okay. super easy. And okay, it's super safe. I see a lot of uh, tree. I don't. I, they're they're more than stands. They're houses. They're like structures that are yeah. built. Um, yep. I noticed you have one in your backyard, which. Um, I see them a lot. You know, you're going down 77 and 71 yeah. uh, into the wooded country, and you can see them. They'll be along the highway facing the woods, right, right? and usually around some sort of water. Yep. Uh, so looking for those places where the where the runners are coming by, right? Um, so, okay, so what about this whole other, all the other stuff? So that's all up in the air. What about all the ground stuff, What the blinds and all that? What's all that stuff? You know, sometimes as a hunter, you, you'll, you'll see deer traffic in an area where there's not a tree, right? So uh, this past week, we hunted in Pennsylvania. Okay. We had, we had a bad wind direction, so a lot of hunting has to do with wind, okay? <clears throat> a deer lives by its nose, and it dies by its nose. That's kind of the golden rule, Okay. Like a buck's nose, when he smells uh, 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 his girlfriend who's uh, ready to be bred, he's following her around, okay? Like, like, yeah. really <laughs> he's following her around by, by, by his nose. But that whitetail's nose is also dissecting anything in its area for, for uh, threats. Sure. Co- coyotes, foxes, people, okay? Okay. So... If, a, if the wind's hitting a coyote or hitting a deer in the face and, and it's your wind coming from your body to him, your chances of shooting that deer are very slim because you're a predator. He's okay. not going to come or he's going to blow it and he's going to turn around and he's going to leave. So you want the wind hitting you in the face if you're hunting, looking, you know, if, you, if, if you're wanting the deer to come from the east. So you're shooting into the wind. Correct. Does that, and I'm assuming that affects your range, and that affects your. I mean, if it's a, if it's a, you know, five to ten, not really, but anything over that, yeah. Okay, and and, and it probably affects your your aim a little bit too. I mean, it, n- not. I mean, not, not so much. Not not, not nominally. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Got it. So, okay. I mean, that's why you see ground blinds set up like in the corner of a cornfield on the ground because of wind direction. Like there might be a tree forty yards away, but if it's always a south wind. And they can't get in there to hunt, and, and, and they set up on the corn edge because they can cut the deer off that way, and they can't smell them. Okay. And then do you guys, yeah, I don't remember, I think I remember my uncle doing this. Do you wear, like, 
stuff like like perf not perfume but musk or deer perfume <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh All right. so the point is there's something to mask your odor so uh we use this product it's called lethal perfume. and it's a spray that is basically it attacks human scent molecules you said, you said lethal yeah Fatality. okay lethal <laughs> So um, it basically it, it it covers the masks and and uh, takes away uh, the the human scent. So it fools the white tail's nose. There are other great products like Scent Crusher or Ozonics, which actually cast ozone into the air and it attacks your mo- the the human scent molecules. So deer come in and they don't smell it. Okay, Andrew just commented he's not into hunting, but he's really enjoying listening. And you, you, he, he said you're very knowledgeable. So I've so. done this for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, cool story, bro. It's my third day. Yeah. <laughs> where, where do we hunt? Okay. Someone asked me this off my uncle. It was always the land or the property. I'm yep. heading down to the land, okay? <laughs> and and uh, the land used to have a fire ring, and then the land had a uh, trailer. Uh, usually a mobile one, and then the land had a more permanent structure trailer, and then the land had a log cabin being built on it. Right. Okay. Right, yeah. So the, it, it, explain to us: it, is is there public? Can I? Is there somewhere where I can grab my gun and just go hunt right now, or do I have to know somebody to hunt on a on a property? You know, a lot of people overlook the 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 gold mine of public hunting that we have here in Ohio. I'm not sure the uh, amount of vast acres of what we actually have here. Uh, for for public hunting, but it's a lot. And every year you hear about somebody shooting a monster buck or two off of state ground. Um, there's a lot. Of, you have the Muskingum watersheds. You have like AEP, which is AEP power that you can pull a permit and hunt there for free down in southern Ohio. Okay. Um, there there are paper companies that will let you hunt for free. So there's there's various different options. You have. Um, Wingfoot out here in Portage County, they just opened that up for public hunting. Really? That's where the dogwood shelters are and all that? Yeah. I've yeah. done weddings there. Yeah. I didn't realize Make that. sure when next wedding you do out there during gun season, wear orange. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, boy. Uh, that deserves one of these. Uh, Larry Co- uh, Covey said he's all about the cabin life. So if you know you know Larry, say yeah. hi to Larry. Um, all right. So point being, then, do you, does it is there a... Is there a separate permit or an extra cost structure or whatever? No, it's it's totally free to the taxpayer. Okay, um, you know if you're a non-resident, obviously you got to you pay a little bit more for license. But there's places like Salt Fork where you can actually pull a camper down. Okay, and we camp there all the time and, and pay to camp at Salt Fork, so you can hook up and have your your water, your electricity, everything, have a place to take a shower and uh, walk from camp and go hunt. Really? Yeah. Yep. That's interesting. Um, all right, so hold on. We got a uh, so Jeremy. Jeremy said Fernwood, Fernwood State Forest. Um, so, all right. So, point being, there are places we can go. So that's really cool. I did. I didn't know that. Right. All right. So the, the next issue is okay. So let's say, and this is. I we see all your toys in the back over here. Okay, all all of your. You got your truck with you, but it looks over there in the corner. It looks like you've got a, a buggy. And I'm guessing that will help to answer this next question, okay? How do you retrieve your harvested game, all right? So yeah. here you are, especially, you know, a lot of hunters, they'll go, and they're not necessarily with people. They're out by themselves. Right. yeah. And you got your four-wheeler, or you got your truck, or you got your whatever, and you shoot this massive two to 300-pound, 10-point buck, which I think you just did like a week ago, didn't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I saw this big, huge animal. nine points. Don't, All right. give, don't give him that. Extra. My bad, my bad. All right. <laughs> the point is, though, um, you know, it's down at the bottom of a ravine, and you're by yourself. Well, it's funny that you say that because <laughs> the deer I shot in Pennsylvania last week went down in the bottom of a ravine. Did he really? I wasn't by myself. I had good friend Matt Perkins with me. He filmed the whole hunt. Okay. And um, my buddy Mark came and picked us up on his side-by-side UTV, and we drove right next to the animal, and all three of us could barely pick the animal up just because of the ma- uh, you know the weight that the 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 dead weight of an animal is uh, is a lot. What's well, extensive? I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, the dead weight of a toddler is a lot. So, <laughs> I mean, that. you know, when they're right. dead tired. Yeah. Bazinga. Right. Point being, and Mark's not a small guy. I know. Yeah. I know Mark. He's a big dude, right? So, um, I can imagine. So, all right. So, but what? Uh, this is some now. This, now to go to public land. Listen to this. Okay. You can't drive one of those on public land. Okay. So what do you? My this, this begs the question. What do you do then? 
You start hiking, bro. You start hiking. <laughs> Is there any time where you just abandon the game? No. No. No, so, no matter Hunter's, what. Hunter's Code of Ethics. <laughs> Right, right. You shot it. You got it. You right. Go okay. Get it. So, so you uh, call in the Marines, man. You <laughs> see who your true friends are. But uh, I and I've heard horror stories of guys that were just had the whole chainsaw with them and just said, "Hey, we'll, we'll, we got to take it out in pieces." Yep. And and it is what it is. Yeah, and, and they actually make systems or they can like field dress it. Yeah, they make backpacks that you can quarter your game out. Okay. And then put it in the backpack and carry it out that way. Okay. So there's, I mean, there's options, but. You know, the best one's your cellular device. <laughs> Call some friends. All right, um, and that that makes sense. That does make sense. All right, so um, all right, so that's that's that one. All right, so now we've we've gone through the hunting process. We we've, we've we found our we found our weapon. We found our clothes. We got our little stand. We 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 shot a doe. We got our first doe. We tag it. We use our tag. Mm-hmm. Okay, we drag it out, and now we get it home. Okay, so now what's the next part of the process in terms of there's field dressing, there's dressing, and then after that, there's the taxidermy option as well. So yeah. talk us through that whole process. Well, you know, first off, um, let's kind of back that up a little bit. So if if I just harvested a deer, and depending on what time it is, I obviously I want to make sure that the 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 internal parts of the deer are all cleaned out, right? Okay. Okay. That's a huge thing because you could shoot a deer and think you have good meat, but if you don't clean it properly. You're gonna taint your meat. So you do you do that's field dressing. So field dressing is when you basically are are I'm just gonna say it gutting the deer. Right. Okay. You're pulling all the stuff out the intestines and all the stuff that could um, basically rot rot or infect the meat. Okay? okay. So as soon as you get those things out and you 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 have tagged the deer first, then you've went through the process of field dressing the deer. Then your your next stop is to the ice shack. Because you want to get ice on that animal as soon as you can. So it's kind of just like fishing from that regard. Yeah. Okay. You, you want to stuff the cavity full of ice. Okay. And, and and then as soon as the butcher shop opens, you want to be able to get it in the butcher shop where they'll you know they'll skin it, they'll they'll take the hair and the hide and stuff off of it. And if you want to you know say you shot a big ten point buck and you wanted to get it mounted, you would then tell the ta- uh, tell the butcher shop, hey, I want this caped out, which means basically they're gonna decapitate the head. And, and and take the fur off so you can then take it to your taxidermist and your taxidermy guy is gonna say, Okay, I have enough hair here on the on the on the pelt that I can actually mount the deer for you. Now, now when they do that, and again folks, some of you will be grossed out about this, but that's okay because that's what this show's about, right? We're talking hunting today. All right. So and, and so put on your your uh your big boy pants and, and let's move on. Um so when when the head let's talk about the head first and and i want to get back to the field dressing part so remind me okay um but for, you went to the taxidermy part so when you when you take that head over is all the stuff now missing from inside like where the neck is like no, for example is there meat there and stuff yeah so basically you'd have if you were my example <clears throat> from the from the front shoulders up so you're going to have the the head the antlers attached to it the eyes I mean everything is going to be there right and then the taxidermist will basically turn everything inside out and start basically filleting it back, kind of back off the skull so to speak okay um and then they put preservatives on it to to keep it from rotting and take you know they call it fleshing they they get all the meat off and they get down to do the they leather. get do you keep that meat is that usable deer uh, meat or some, no some of the some of the some of the taxidermy guys will actually keep that meat and use it for stuff. Okay, um, but most of the time, it's the part of the deer where there really isn't anything. Not, not good. Yeah. Not good eats. Okay, you might get a couple hamburger patties or something out of it if you if you wanted to be picky. But sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, I was just curious. All right, all right. So then back to the field dressing portion. Um, and this again, this can be considered gross. But do you just leave all that stuff there, the intestines and everything? Um, you know there, what I mean. There, there are coyotes. That's my point. There's there something's going to eat it quickly. There are buzzards. There right. are. You can make are, a lot of animals happy. Yeah. It's yeah. the cir- cycle, circle of life. It, it is. It is. Um, <laughs> you know, and I know guys that won't shoot. You know, like if I'm hunting on private property, I I uh, always have that one spot where I can go. Maybe it's a creek, so I can wash my hands up and make sure the game's good, and 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 then take it out. You know, the same spot. Um, obviously you don't want to shoot a deer today and go hunt the same spot next day. Cause chances are coyotes are going to be all over the place. Okay. Right. So that's a little, a little thing, but yeah, you know, clean it out. 
you know, if somebody, if you're hunting private land and somebody's blessed you with private land privileges, uh, don't do that in their front yard. You know, that's a, sure. that's a, a valid point. Sure. And I have heard stories of that guys dragging deer out to the trucks and not knowing any better and actually just right in the side of the guy's yard are doing that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, um, but, but those are, there are people that just don't no you yeah know, so. and that's the whole point yeah. that's why we're having this discussion um all right so then so okay so you know the taxidermy parts handled um do you have you ever butchered your own meat have you ever tried that or i i have tried it and i decided that i will let the butcher be the butcher okay because it's hard i would yeah. think it's hard to do yeah and and most of the time you're, when you're when you're harvesting the animal it's it's cold out so the meat's cold and it's kind of frozen and okay Okay. All right. So what's a, and again, let's go back to the cost structure, all this kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. So if I want a typical head to toe outfit, you're talking a couple hundred bucks is what you're talking, right? Typical gun is in the two two to $500 range, depending on how good it is. So we're already at 700 there. And then your, your license is 25, your tags 20. Um, so, you know, we're, we're at the, we're in the 800 range right now. So mm-hmm. then what's it cost usually to get, let's say you've got a decent head and you want it mounted. What's a typical taxidermy cost? 425, 375, right around. Really? There. You're yeah. kidding me. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Wow. Okay. Um, Bazinga. so now we're at 1200. Okay. Let's say, so, <laughs> all right. So what about then, then what's the butcher portion? Beef is way cheaper, folks. Way <laughs> cheaper. We do this out of passion, and 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 that's what, why. What's a typical butcher cost then? I mean, you're looking at, and some of them go off of weight, but you, I mean, you could find a butcher that'll do it for maybe sixty five, eighty five bucks. Okay, but it depends what you want to do with the animal. So you can do like a standard cut that's like burgers, steaks, roasts ribs that kind of thing okay um but if you want to do like jerky or deer sticks or summer sausage then it's going to increase your cost so i would say between 100 to 300 okay okay so we're in the 1500 hundred dollar range right the, now the deer that i just shot last uh tuesday in pennsylvania would have cost 200 dollars for what to to process to get okay to, yeah okay and then and then a lot of times a lot of people don't know this too is when you if you shoot a buck and you want to have it mounted Okay, there's a caping fee. So if the if the butcher shop has to take time to go through and do that extra work for for the deer head, then they usually charge you thirty five dollars for that as well. Okay, all right. Uh, Jerry's over here saying, okay, then you got to account for gas, food, and lodging, right? Because mm-hmm. it's just like staying at a hotel. You got to have, you know, you're spending a couple hundred bucks in food to feed everybody that's with you, and then it's usually a hundred to two hundred to get to your land. So yeah, okay. So we're ta- we're in the two grand range right There's now. There's some good plasma banks around Ohio that you can donate <laughs> plasma to to, to pay for your hunting habit. All right. Point being, it's not a cheap. It's not cheap to get into, but once you're in it, you're in it. And, yeah. and the initial investment, obviously, is the the big yeah, the absolutely. big part, right? Yeah. And and then well, let's go a whole different direction. Okay. So I watched a, one of the videos I watched was actually you and Mark, and it was hunting turkey. So what what's the whole how's that work okay so you know turkey is a lot smaller animal and you know it's one of those you just gotta do you still field dress it out there during during that or do do you just take it because you know if i remember correctly when you buy a when you go buy a bird for thanksgiving it comes with all the gizzards and stuff in there that you can use to cook with stuffing and whatnot yep so how does that all work now well uh, uh, there's a lot of misinterpretation between a uh, a a farm-raised turkey and a wild turkey okay? okay A farm-raised turkey is chilling, man. He's cooped up, literally cooped up. Yep. Right, and they're 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 pumping wing, them with hormones. They're wing to wing. They're pumped full of hormones. <laughs> they got they got thunder thighs. You know what I'm saying? They're, sure. They're big. Okay. A wild turkey will range like six or seven miles a day. Okay. Okay. So they're walking. They're lean, mean, okay. breeding machines, man. Right. Turkey hunting is not like deer hunting because turkey hunting, you hear a bird call, gobble. Up on the ridge, right? And you... He gobbles back that was, at you. That's pretty good. <laughs> You're going back and forth. You're having a conversation, right? You hear people say turkey calling, okay? Is that the piece of wood thing, right? Well, there's that, and then there's mouth calls, you know, okay. diaphragm calls. But 
you're 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 talking his love language. Like you want to know what gets him fired up to sure. get him to respond to come into you so you can harvest him. Now I believe I can fly. They fly. Fifty five yes. miles an hour. I, I've that. seen it. I had four of them land in my front yard in West Akron. Really? I I, I you might have to set up a blind. I look <laughs> I, this was four or five years ago, and I'm in my daughter's room. I'm cleaning something, and I see out of the corner of my eye, I see what I thought was a Boeing 747 landing, right? Uh, it's just this massive shadow. And then I look outside, and there's four of them in the front yard because there was we had one of those, like, bird feeder seed things. Oh, eating it up. Oh, and they're all just pecking away. And I'm like, and yeah. I, I look out the window. I, took, I got a great picture of it, and they yeah. were, like, three feet away. It's so. amazing what the, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources have done to restore and 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 make whitetail deer and turkey so sustainable in Ohio. Turkeys, you know, ten years ago were really down, and now you see them in the, in the cities, like you're saying. But to go back, Hank, to the conversation of the difference between the turkeys and field dressing. So a wild turkey, typically, you just breast them out, okay? okay. Because because it's so they don't have thunder thighs. They're so they're lean. Wa- they're walking miles and miles, and that's and, dark meat. It'd be like. Yeah, eating this cup, man, right. because they're they're tough. They walk all over the place. Okay. So, but you breast them out, man, and, and I'll tell you what I love to do. And my wife loves it, loves it, loves it. We will take uh, ranch salad dressing, okay. buttermilk ranch salad dressing. Okay, pour it in a Ziploc bag, like Hartville friend, Hartville brand. Pour it in a bag. Take a turkey breast and stick it in there. Let it sit in there for twenty four hours. Put it on the grill. Slow cook it, right? And when that baby's one hundred and sixty five degrees, it's the best. Thing you've ever eaten and it's all probably succulent oh my gosh it's a great word isn't it yeah all right so we'll use that um all right and that that literally that literally takes me to my very next question okay and that's good eats okay oh. so it, it, you know hunting culture the whole concept is uh we are we're men and women going back to our roots as hunters and gatherers, and now we are going to prepare that food. Yeah, okay? absolutely. So talk to us about what, what are all the different things that you can do. First of all, how, what do you, how do you eat a squirrel? I mean, what, explain that to me. Is that just a, for fun? Or I, 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 <laughs> I have eaten squirrel. And uh, believe it or not, so it's it's not bad. Okay. Okay. Everybody it, always uses the classic, hey, it tastes like chicken. Chicken. I was going to say it took it from me. But it literally does. It tastes like chicken. Squirrels don't have a bunch of meat on them. I wouldn't think. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but let's talk about rabbit. Okay. Rabbit is phenomenal to eat. And I'll take, I'll take red wine and I'll marinate my rabbit in red wine. Okay. And then cook it and put a little bit of brown sugar in on, on top of it. Okay. And it is the sweetest, best tasting form of wild animal that you'll eat. We we talking uh we talking grill or smoke or how, I'll, I'll grill it, slow grill cook it, it. Okay. Yeah, throw it on the Traeger or whatnot. Okay. Yeah. Um all right, so what about and you we talked about turkey, so you got a technique there. Deer, uh, you know, I've heard so many things about deer and what always comes up is jerky, 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 right? Yeah. So what what how do you deer is a much leaner meat, correct? Yeah. So how do you make it tender to eat? Like if you're having a deer steak or a deer patty or jerky or whatever, how, talk us through that whole process. Well, like like a deer steak, obviously the 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 slower that you can cook it or if you can marinate it, it's going to have a, a huge impact on how it tastes. Now, one thing that um, I, my wife and I just kind of figured out. So. Um, with me harvesting a deer so early in the season this year, okay, because usually I don't harvest a deer till like mid October, and this was a really early harvest for us. Well, I got it processed. We brought it home. I cooked steaks. My wife absolutely loved it, and we were trying to figure out why it tasted so different than the deer that was later in the year, like into October, November, December. And the and the reason's this: one, the diet of a whitetail is completely different mm-hmm. early in the season, okay. Right now, the whitetails are starting to eat fatty stuff, okay? So they're going to eat soybeans and corn and acorns, and they're, they're piling on fat. And then their bodies go through a change, right? They've they, they they, got to winterize themselves. they got to winterize yeah. themselves. But, but, but physically, in breeding season, their bodies go through change. Their hormones change and all that. So they're pumping all kinds of different stuff through their meat. Okay. okay? Now, the deer that I just shot... The more you know. The more you know. Okay. The deer I just shot... It was is the best tasting deer that I've ever been a part of. Okay, is it because it's right at the end of summer. 
because he's not pumped. He, he's, he's not, not in winter up. mode yet. He's not in, in. He's not in winter mode yet. He's not in beast mode yet. You know. Well, and 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 again, winter mode obviously throughout the well. When when is the drop dead last day you can hunt in Ohio? Typically, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Okay. It's that whole, that, and that and that would be an archery season. So archery season is very very long in Ohio. It's one. Okay. Of the, it's the second longest season in any state in the in the nation. Okay. Um. So. To that end, then, I mean, you figure those deer are going through a month, month and a half, two months. Well, because Super Bowl is usually first week of February. Yep. So that's two full months of potentially, you know, net freezing weather, right? Yeah. And 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 you know, late, the later in the season you go, the, the does are usually carrying fawns. Okay. How's so, that work? I mean, have you ever have you ever shot a pregnant deer before? Yeah. Is, yeah. is it is it what what's the is there a protocol for that, or does it matter? Or what's no, and and only time usually. I mean, when I was young hunter, I didn't really even think about it. Now that I'm, now that I'm a dad and a husband, I yeah. think about it different. You know sure, what I mean? So sure. it's a diff- different type of maturity sure. when it comes to hunting. There's a lot of guys that won't shoot does after you know, like mid December, because they know that they're that they Most are most likely caring. They're pregnant, yeah. right? But there are there are areas like let me let me tell you about the place I just hunted was in Pennsylvania. Okay. Where they have twenty two car accidents, you know, in a day from the deer population, where every time you sit you see thirty to forty deer. So in that manner, if you were if you have a doe tag and are lucky to get a doe tag in Pennsylvania, if you shoot a doe, the chances are you didn't shoot a doe, you shot a doe or two or three because of she's carrying babies. Sure. So so there is a, a protocol of Man, I can't shoot one because I know she's carrying. But there's a protocol of if she's alive and she has two more, they're probably going to get ran over by a car too. So yeah. and, and put people in harm's way yeah, on the road. Yeah, and 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 again, that's an interesting way of, of thinking about it. Um, so what about the? We talked about turkey. All right, so we're, the jerky process. Explain that. How does that work? And, and uh, Jerry had said deer needs to be aged usually three to five days. Yeah, and 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 if you take your deer to the processor, typically they'll hang it. Yep. And and they'll let it you know cool down, and they'll do all that stuff. So they'll have it you know two three days where they hang it, and then they butcher it and, and vacuum pack it or however they package it. So yeah, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, jer- but jerky needs to sit and dry out for a while, doesn't it? How's that work? Uh, jerky. I mean, they. I mean, they'll take the whatever the meat you choose to make, you know, like usually like round steaks or whatever, or right. they'll take ground meat and they'll run it through a press and make, you know, strips of meat. Okay. Um, but they, I mean, they can run that right through. Like we were eating deer steaks on the way home from Pennsylvania. Okay. Okay. All right. So that covers the food part. So now, and again, we've, t- we've touched on this already a, a bunch of times. So we're doing good on time here. We'll be done in a little bit. Um, what, what, uh, how do you guys handle? You know, when you when there is criticism of hunting, what 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 are some of the techniques that you use in terms of having discussions with people? How do you handle that? And you know, growing up, my I was always taught honesty is the best policy. Like my honest thoughts of how somebody that doesn't hunt views it, and taking how how I view it and how I, how it was raised and bred into me, and saying, man, I could see why you think that, but let me. Let me try to educate you, not necessarily sway you, but let me educate you why I do what I do and why my passion is. My passion is because this was something, one of the very min- moments that I remember my dad taking me to hunt. I remember being 12 years old and I watching my dad shoot a rabbit and my dad handed me a shotgun. He handed me a shotgun. I looked at him like, you got to be out of your mind. You're going to shoot the shotgun. See that tree right there? I want you to shoot it. Guess what? I never played with a gun a day in my life. You know why? Because I watched when I squeezed that trigger and what that gun did in the tree, curiosity went out the window. I knew that it was a weapon, and I knew when I pointed that weapon at a tree or a, a person, a deer, or whatever it was, that it was going to have a vital effect not only on me, but on whatever one is on the other end. So you see all these things that are going on in schools and stuff. We talked about it earlier. Hunting is a huge tool to educate people of what not to do. Sure. You, you, you know, so... But, but 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 the people that don't necessarily like the hunting side of it don't really realize that the hunters, the guys, the good guys with guns, and there are bad guys like anything else, but we're the guys that want to say we love our Second Amendment right, whether it's with a gun, a bow, a crossbow, whatever it is, but we want to educate and, and teach people what these weapons can really do because that's how we were taught. Sure. 
And, and um, you know, I had mentioned to you before the show started, I watched the, the video. Mark, if you're still on, hi, Mark. Um, I watched your video of you. Uh, getting your first turkey, and I it was it was what it's with this 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 huge it human blew his mind. this huge human man, and here he is moved to all to tears basically, and and giggling like a little four year old, right? He's like, oh my gosh, oh my <laughs> gosh, right? Um, uh. Point being, it, it's it when you when you take the hypocrisy out of hunting, uh, you know, I it was jarring and shocking for me to see that video, but then I immediately thought. But I'm first in line at, at Acme, picking up my turkey, getting ready for Thanksgiving. Yeah. So, in other words, if you eat meat at all, folks, somebody somewhere is killing an animal. All right. Um, and it, it mm. could either be done humanely or inhumanely, depending on how you look at it. Right. But in this scenario, um, I, I'm not defending or attacking or fall. I'm falling right in the middle when it comes to hunting. When I look at it now, my view has changed slightly because now I'm looking at it as. These folks are literally out there harvesting a um, a life that they are then going to convert into food for their family and friends. Yeah. And, and if you look at it that way, it's and, a whole and, different thought and process. That is uh, uh, an American tradition, right? It's 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 a biblical aspect, right? Right. And and so so those two things there are are huge. Well. You mentioned the Bible, all right? So up until this point, three throughout ago has been fairly agnostic in terms of our viewpoints in regards to uh, our Christianity. And, and, and most people know that we go to church, and we're, we've been fairly open about that. But I want everybody to take a look over my shoulder right now, and, and you can see this beautiful truck, even though it's not a Ford. And it says, Created Outdoors, right on the side. And there's a there's a cross there. The, the tree has been art, artistically made into a cross. And you can see right down here is someone who is kneeling, okay? So that brings me to my next question. What else does Created Outdoors stand for? So Created Outdoors, we are a ministry first and a hunting show second. You know, I think that um, a lot of hunters and a lot of people in general, even people that just go to the parks, um, we, we, we go and we see God's creation, right? Like, when you see the turkeys laying in your front yard, they're like, how cool is that, right? Or when you're walking through the park and, and you see a, 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 a mom nursing two does, I mean, those are things that stick in your brain that are, are, are permanently burned and ingrained in your DNA because I mean, you were just blessed with that, you know? And I call those God-created moments, right? God created the beasts of the field uh, and, and, and of the sea and gave us dominion over those animals, you know? And, and I know with, with me growing up in the middle of the city, in the middle of Kenmore, that every time I set foot in the woods and I got to hear the turkeys wake up on the roost just gobbling their brains out, or I got to hear a deer walking through the woods on a cold, frosty morning where the leaves are just crunching like Rice Krispie treats, those were God-created memories for me, you know? And it, and it just, you know, like I can look at my deer heads on the wall that I've been blessed with, and I can remember the moment of impact how it unfolded, how it happened with each one of them. And those were God-created moments. So we wanted to take people from just looking at the kill and the outdoor experience to know that there was, there was a guy, right? There was a guy, God, who created this, this whole planet, this whole program for us to have dominion over, and we want to give the glory back to him. Okay. And you know, I've 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 been a part of your Bible study a few times, and I've I've watched your show, and 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 folks, the the closing thought that I'll leave on that topic is, uh, it's worth checking out. So if if you if you have a church that you go to, or or if you don't, uh, if you're interested in hunting at all, uh, or if you're interested in just having a really fun, good group of guys to learn to. Uh, to be around and to come hang out, um, please make sure that you look up Created Outdoors. You can find them at? CreatedOutdoors.com. And uh, Friday night, actually, our, our 14th episode, Hank of the Year, airs uh, this coming Friday. So it's our last episode of the year. Okay. And um, it's it's uh, it's really cool to see what God's doing with Created Outdoors. Sure. And they can also find you. You have your own Facebook page. That's how we found you. Yeah, and we do um, so Monday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Obviously, most people on here are from Ohio. But um, uh, we do a Monday night devotional, and I'll just put together something that the Lord's teaching me or putting on my heart, or we just have a real transparent conversation like we are now about something that 
we feel is uh, n- needed to talk about. And uh, we have a, a really good time with the, with the guys and the girls that join in. That sounds good. All right, uh, do you have any closing thoughts before I shut us down? No, sir, I don't have anything. All right, well, once again, thank you for having us out tonight. Awesome, we really Hank, appreciate it. I appreciate your time. All right, so once again, folks, we've had a good discussion here tonight, and hopefully you've enjoyed our discussion, picked up some tips and pointers along the way. Uh, we're going to be posting this everywhere and sharing it because I think there's been some incredible insight shared as to how to begin hunting if you are not into it right now. Folks, make sure you turn in next week as I return from a conference to join forces with our other show, our sister show, The Hop and the Bean, and we're going to be in downtown Akron at Lock 3 covering the Oktoberfest. But until then, I don't know where I'm going, but there ain't no sense in being late. Everybody say good night, Shirley. Good night, Shirley. This podcast is a copyright of Moon Garden Media Limited.